Well, Cedar Street Baptist Church, I love you so very much. It's the joy of my heart to be with you here this morning. And uh, this is a sweet time to be together as we enter into a new season. If you weren't here last week, or if it's your first time, welcome. Uh, we entered into a new sermon series that God laid on my heart several months ago, and we started last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as we're going verse by verse by verse these next few weeks. And the title of our sermon series is Living the Resurrection Life. Living the Resurrection Life. We're going to learn how Jesus rising from the dead totally transforms our past, present, and eternal future. And here's my goal for the series. My goal is a from this time moving forward, when I say the word resurrection, you'll understand resurrection in what I call 3D. He did, he does, he'll do. He did, he does, he'll do. Resurrection ought to be a transforming reality in your life if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk a lot about that throughout this series. Last week we talked in the first couple of verses of 1 Corinthians 15 that no matter where you're at in your Christian life, if you're not a believer and you're, you want to come to faith, or if you are a believer and you want to grow in your faith, last week we said you got to go back to the gospel. The good news of who Jesus is and what he did is not just the diving board that gets you into Christianity, it's the whole pool. It is the root of our faith. We go back every day to who Jesus is and we seek his grace to be strong where we are weak. We seek his grace to find our identity of who we truly are. And we seek his grace to remember where we're headed. So that was last week. Now as we look a little further in 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 8. And the title of our message here this morning is, Have Faith to Face the Facts. Have Faith to Face the Facts. And in fact, for some of our more seasoned members here, I'm going to bring up a, an old TV show that you may remember from the 1950s. Does anybody remember the show Dragnet? <laughs> Sergeant Joe Friday had a certain expression as he had a pen in, in one hand and paper in the other. What would he say? Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. What I'm going to share with you is the most historically rooted set of facts that you'll ever hear. And my goal today, again, if you're not a believer, my goal today is to set the facts straight so that you will place your trust where the facts are. And if you are a believer, my goal today, by the help of the Holy Spirit, is to strengthen you in your faith. That if you're a believer in, the Jesus, in Jesus Christ, that your heart, mind, and soul, your eternity is placed in the safest place it can be. Because it is rooted in historical fact. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. That's what we're going to talk about here this morning. So as our second message of the series unfolds, what's our big idea in one sentence? In one sentence, here it is. To live the resurrection life, have faith to face the facts that the redeeming work of Christ is historical truth. I'll say it again. To live the resurrection life, have faith to face the facts that the redeeming work of Christ is historical truth. So if you're ready to face the facts together with faith, would you join me by turning to the book of 1 Corinthians? Again, 1 Corinthians comes after Romans, before 2 Corinthians in your New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, grab the Pew Bible in front of you or beside you or on page 1142 in your Pew Bible. And if you would stand at this time, out of the reverence of the reading of God's holy, infallible, Inerrant and fully sufficient word, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to start in verse 3 and work our way down to verse 8. Hear God's word to us through his servant, the Apostle Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit of God. Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely at born, he appeared also to me. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love you. And 
Lord, we are here today seeking you. Oh, Lord, we're so distracted. There are so many things happening right now in our own lives, in this community, in this country, and in this world. It's like we're drifting further and further away from you. And yet there you are. You have not changed. What was true yesterday is true today and true forever. And so, Lord, I pray that today would be a day that we would anchor ourselves in the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. If somebody has come into this room and they don't know Christ, Lord, I pray today is the day of salvation. If somebody's in this room and they once made a profession but they're having doubts, I pray today is a day that doubts are resolved. And if today's a day that someone has come in here with strong faith and maybe they're in a dark place, I just pray this truth would bring us into radiant light. Whatever the case may be, Lord, your word does not return void. It accomplishes what it was set out to do. So, Lord, help me to set it out and you do the work in all of our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray and God's people said, amen. amen. So last week we kind of set the tone a little bit. I know a lot of people are coming and going these first few weeks of the school year. Uh, so let me try to catch everybody up if this is your first time hearing uh, this particular series. We said last week we need to understand the context of the church at Corinth and how it fits into where we are today. So the church at Corinth, okay, the city of Corinth was a port city. It was in Greece, ruled by, ruled by Roman authority. And it would be like what we consider today as Manhattan, just an epicenter of culture, an epicenter of religion, an epicenter of philosophy. As all these, these nations were coming in off the Mediterranean and sharing all these ideas, this was a place of higher education. This was an exchanging of thoughts. So the church at Corinth, when they came to faith in Jesus Christ, they had to deal with all of these religions and all of these rituals and all of these philosophies. They had a lot to work through. And the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth and he's saying, let's go back to what I told you when you first came to faith and when this church was first established. And that's what he's sharing in 1 Corinthians 15. This is a complete review of the very bedrock of our faith. And as Corinth needed to be reminded of it then, oh, we need to be reminded of it today. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? What does it mean to come to faith? What does it mean to live the faith? How do I know that I'm growing in the faith? What's to come in the future? All these things are covered in this one chapter. It's, there's so much meat on the bone, and that's why, like I said, like South Georgia barbecue, we're just cooking it low and slow each week. Now, as we get into this particular portion of 1 Corinthians 15 in verses 3 through 8, what I want to say is, as Paul is rehearsing the work of Jesus... Historians believe that what he's saying, inspired of the Holy Spirit, is actually part of an ancient creed that was first written just a few weeks after Pentecost. For those of you that are familiar with the New Testament, in the book of Acts, okay, we see that in Acts 1, we see that... Uh, Jesus Christ ascends to the Father and promises that he's going to send down his Holy Spirit. And then we see in Acts 2, the time of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit indwells the people of God, the church is established. And at the end of Acts 2, one of the great passages of the New Testament, Dalton went over it a couple weeks ago, in Acts, 40, Acts 2, 42 through 47, we see what the early church is doing. They're gathering in homes, they're breaking bread, and they're reciting the teaching of the apostles. Well, historians believe that within a few weeks after Pentecost, when these churches started being established, they sat down and wrote down, what's the bedrock of our faith? It's Jesus Christ. Who is he? He's the Son of God. What did he do? He lived, he died, he was buried, he rose, and we have seen him. And so a lot of people believe that Paul, again, he's inspired of the Holy Spirit, He's reciting to the people, remember this creed, remember what the church is established on. And that's what we ourselves need to remember today. Now there's, a, there's an expression that is mentioned a few times in verses three through eight, and I wanna stop here for a minute and talk about it because it's so important. I'm not gonna assume for a moment that everybody is on the same page in this room right now, so I'm gonna try to get us on the same page. Paul says several times in this passage, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures. Paul's saying, according to the word of God, the place of supreme authority. Now, most of you have heard my testimony. 
I professed faith in Jesus Christ at 27 years old, but I did not grow in my faith until I was 29 years old. Because two years after giving my life to Jesus, I could not with good conscience surrender to the Bible as the Word of God. I couldn't do it. I needed to have fact upon fact upon fact so that I could take all of my heart, mind, and soul and place my, my faith and my trust in the truth. But I will say this, after a two-year journey of seeking day and night, wanting to know God affirmed in my heart from the first word to the last, you can trust this book. Now, there are many of you in this room that would say, well, I don't know why you had such a struggle with that, Bo. I've, I was raised in church. I believed in the Bible all my life. Let me just say this. When I was struggling with my faith and wanting answers, I went to a lot of people like that, and they couldn't give me answers. Can you tell me why the Bible is the word of God? Well, my grandmother had it on her coffee table, and I read it every Sunday. Let me just say this. That's not good enough. You're never going to influence somebody for Jesus Christ because you want them to be impressed with your family. You need to believe that the Bible is the word of God because you know the historical facts about the word and because you yourself are in it in such a way that your life is being transformed. If you believe the Bible because of grandma, that's not good enough. You'll never be a faithful witness for Jesus Christ. I want your faith in the word to be your own. And it's the safest place for you to be. I'm going to give you a couple reasons why. If you're in this room today and perhaps you're questioning, can I trust the Bible? Can I just say it's okay to have questions? The only way to get answers is to be honest. And if you're in this room and you're a faithful Christian, don't you ever shame somebody who has questions about the Bible. Because all you'll do is push them further away. Everybody in this room is at a different place in their faith. So if you are in this room and you have questions or you're in this room and you love the word but you want to know how you can share it with other people that they can trust it the way you do, let's, let me give you some support. The first thing I would say, if the Bible is the word of God, then there is no higher authority than the Bible itself to affirm its nature. All right, if the Bible is the word of God, but the highest authority on telling you that the Bible is the word of God is Billy Graham or some other human being, then you're saying that Billy Graham or some other human being is higher than the Bible itself. So we have to start with the Bible to know what type of book the Bible is. And the Bible is very clear about what it is. I'll give you a couple verses. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Paul says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So it's God's fresh breath. The word of God is from the mouth of God. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, the apostle Peter says, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Paul says it's breathed out by God. Peter says as it's breathed out by God, it's written down by men and guided by the Holy Spirit the entire time. And then the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So that author takes it a step further and says the word of God is unlike anything that's ever been written because it's living it's active and it gets right to the core of your soul when you read it there's no other book like God's word now you say okay Bo you made some strong evidence inside the Bible but if it really is the word of God it should stand with historical truth outside of the Bible and I would say you're exactly right so let me lay some truth on you the Bible is set apart unlike any other book in the history of human literature. The Bible was written over the course of 1,500 years by more than 40 different authors on three different continents in three different languages, and it has more historical support. Right now, there are close to 6,000 ancient Greek manuscripts that date back to the lifetime of the apostles. To simply put it, there's more support for this book than any other thing that human beings have ever written in the history of human literature. It's laughable how much support we have. You say, but why does it matter? Why does it matter that there are close to 6,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament? I'll tell you why. Because people always say, well, it's, the Bible's been rewritten by men. 
for, a, for one man or a set of men to try to rewrite the Bible, they would have to go all over the world, collect all 6,000 manuscripts and rewrite them as the Bible is being retranslated for the Bible to be rewritten by men. Simply put, this cannot be manipulated by human hands. It's been inspired by a divine God. And it is the primary way that God speaks to his people. And so as we look at verses 3 through 8, and Paul says, according to the scriptures, he's saying, according to the most trustworthy source you can find, Jesus Christ died and rose again for us. Now, I'm going to give some other facts as we keep moving through, but I wanted to, to set that in motion. You know, Martin Luther, the great reformer, back in 16th century Europe, who launched the Protestant Reformation, one of the reasons we have a Protestant denomination like we have here at this church, one of the things he said towards the end of his life, they said, Martin Luther, how did you stand up to Rome? How did, you, how did, you, how did God use you the way that he used you? And Martin Luther said, I've done nothing. The Word did the work. The Word of God did the work. So if we're missing that today, if we're missing a movement of God today, guess where it starts? It starts in the Word. It starts in the Word. You know, when I've had conversations with non-believers, I remember talking with a brother who... Uh, back in Philadelphia several years ago who's not a Christian and I shared my faith and I began sharing all these different types of things and he said you know Bo you can say whatever you want but at the end of the day it all comes down to a leap of faith at the end of the day you can't prove it to me so it all comes down to a leap of faith well in, in, one, in one way he's right but in another way he's wrong he's right in that yes it does come down to faith Jesus Christ wants you to place your faith in him. As we'll look at later in the message, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. On the other hand, it's not a blind leap. It is a rational decision rooted in historical truth. When you know the facts, giving your life to Jesus is the only rational human response. And the reason people do it is not because they don't know the facts, it's because they want to be the God of their own life. They don't want to be accountable. Because once you follow Jesus Christ, he is your boss man. He is your God, he is your Lord, he is your Savior, and you're accountable to him. And people don't like accountability. So I want you to be thinking about this as we look at the facts. So I want to look at four key historical facts right out of the text in the time that we have left. And I want to ask, do we have faith to face these facts together? Here's the first. Number one, have faith because the death of Jesus is a fact. The death of Jesus is a fact. The beginning of verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance, meaning I've told you what is the absolute most important thing you need to know to have faith. It's what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Jesus Christ, a literal historical figure, not a figment of our imaginations, a literal human being, fully God, fully man. He took on literal flesh and blood and he died a literal physical death. It is a fact. And he did so to atone for our literal sins that we will literally be judged on if we do not receive him by grace through faith. You say, well, all right, most, even skeptics would say everybody believes that Jesus Christ actually roamed the earth. Even a, a hardcore atheist would say it would be impossible to say that they made up this person, Jesus. All right, there's plenty of historical records outside the Bible that claim there was a religious figure named Jesus Christ. How do we know that he actually physically died? Because the Gospels lay out basically what took place as he was put on a Roman cross on that Good Friday. But how do we know that he died? Because there are skeptics, skeptics that would say, all right, we believe in a historical figure. We even believe that he was put on a cross. But there's crazy theories that come out all the time. One's called the swoon theory. Here's the swoon theory. That Jesus was on the cross and he didn't actually die. He just passed out. So that when they took him off the cross and put him on the, in the tomb, the reason he rose from the dead is he wasn't really dead. He just, he needed three days to, you know, to recuperate and get enough strength. And then he came out of the tomb on Easter Sunday. Well, I'm going to give you two indisputable facts as to why you can know that Jesus died. Here's the first. Romans were good at crucifixion because their life depended on it. 
If a Roman soldier was in charge of putting a criminal on the cross and nailing the nails into their wrists and feet, and they took a criminal off the cross when that criminal had not yet died and they survived crucifixion, guess who was going to be put on the cross next? The soldier. And what happened right before he was taken off the cross on Good Friday? What did the soldier do to make sure Jesus was physically dead? Pierced his side. And what came out when they pierced his side? A little bit of blood, but a whole lot of water. Now, most historians believe that Jesus suffocated before he bled out because when you're on the cross, what you're dealing with most of the time is breathing. One of the reasons that they have that little pedestal that you can put your feet on is they're lifting themselves up, catching another breath until they're too tired to stay up, and when they droop over is when they suffocate. But if he didn't suffocate, we know that he bled out because when he got pierced in the side, water's the last thing that comes out of the human body after blood. All right, so that's the first way that we know historically Jesus physically died. The second I would say is this, what Jesus Christ himself said when he was taking his final breath. Right before he said to the Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, the Gospels reveal that he said three words in English that is translated in one word in Greek. Okay, we, we translate it as three words in English, but there's one word in the Greek, one word. It's tetelestai. In three words in English, it is, it is finished. Jesus Christ died for our sins. He's saying, it is finished. Everything that is necessary for me to gather my church, everything that is necessary for people's sins to be forgiven, for them to be reconciled to God, for them to be entered into the kingdom of God forever, for them to abide in me and I in them, everything that is necessary for God and man to have relationship has finally been done because he drank, drank the last drop of the cup of God's wrath. He said, it is finished. Tetelestai. And he didn't say, it is finished, but I'm still alive and I've got more to do. No, when he said, it is finished, he breathed his last breath, he committed his soul to the Father, and our salvation has been secure ever since. He did everything that was necessary. He died, but he didn't just die. He died for our sins. And you need to, where you are today, receive this. He died for your sins. He died because you are required to be perfect if you want to live eternally with a holy God. And he died because you're not perfect. He was perfect for you. And if you reject him, then you're on the hook for your own record. He died. Jesus did everything necessary. Now, here's what I want to say before we move on to our second point. There's two things you ought to rest in today and stay focused on today if Jesus literally took care of everything. Number one, if it's finished, then you yourself need to rest that you cannot add to or take away from his salvation. You need to put your trust fully in him. The second is this. You may not think about this, but this has been on my mind a lot. Jesus Christ only lived on this planet for 33 years in human form before he ascended to the Father. He could say it is finished because he did more in 33 years than we could do in 133. And he could say every single thing the Father has given me to do, I've done it. My question to you is this. You will stand before God. And you will know it's by the grace of Jesus. But at the same time, as unworthy as you will feel, you will want to know that you have an offering to lay at his feet. He gave you a mission on this earth. And the question is, are you focused on what that mission is in such a degree that if you took your last breath, you could say, it is finished. I did everything for Jesus that he gave me to do out of love for what he did for me. Because I do a lot of funerals and I can tell you, everybody fits in one of two categories. You have A, people that finished the race or B, people that ran out of gas. The difference is focus. The ones that finished the race knew what they were called to do and they did it. And I call you as your pastor, your brother, and your friend, get focused on what God has called you to do. You know, several years ago, there was a pastor in Ellabel. I heard this story secondhand, but there's a pastor in Ellabel, and uh, it may have been 10 years ago, and he was laying in bed with his wife, and he looked at her and he said, you know, for the first time in my life, I feel like I've done everything 
that God has called me to do. And he kissed his wife goodnight and he never woke up. Died of a heart attack right there in his bed. But he died saying, Tetelestai, it is finished. Get serious about what you're called to do and do it. That's number one. Have faith because the death of Jesus is a fact. Number two, have faith because the burial of Jesus is a fact. So they took him off the cross because he had literally died. And they handed him over to his family. And we do know there was a historical figure. Outside of Scripture, there's proof of a historical figure named Joseph of Arimathea. He was wealthy. He was a Pharisee of the Sanhedrin. And as far as we can tell, he's one of the few Pharisees that had genuine faith in Jesus Christ. He was a friend of the family. And he said, take Jesus and put him in my tomb. And so there was a literal figure. He was placed in a literal tomb. I've not been to Israel. I wish I had the opportunity. Some of you have been there. You can go visit the tomb today. It's a real tomb. Came from a real person. And Jesus was literally put there. And how do we know this? Because we know on Easter Sunday, there were people as part of his family, including Mary Magdalene, who went to anoint the body because they couldn't anoint him during the Sabbath. And so they literally went to this literal place and the Romans literally put guards in front of that place. And at a moment in the morning, unknown to anybody but God himself, that stone was rolled back. And that gets us to our next point. Have faith because the death of Jesus is a fact. Have faith because the burial of Jesus is a fact. Third, have faith because the resurrection of Jesus is a fact. It says that he was buried in the second part of verse 4, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. This goes back to Easter morning. We're going to look at this a lot through the next few weeks. If Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, you and I are wasting our time in this room right now. We are wasting our time. Again, we're going to look at this in a couple weeks. Paul says that if, if all of our belief is in a resurrection that didn't happen, we're the most pitiful creatures on planet earth. I should sob and weep that I have wasted my life telling you something that didn't happen. I know that it did. And I give my life to telling people that it did. It is a historical fact. It is a historical fact. Now, there's a lot of different ways in which I could explain uh, the, the resurrection. In a moment, we're going to talk about the, uh, the eyewitnesses. There were hundreds and hundreds of eyewitnesses as the apostle Paul was writing this letter in the New Testament to the church at Corinth. Many of these eyewitnesses were still alive, and so if he was making something up, they could have shot it down real quickly, and they did not. But I want to, I want to share a quote with you. I've shared this a few times over the years. I love this quote. I want you to think about it. The late, great Chuck Colson wrote this quote about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't know Chuck Colson, Chuck Colson was the hatchet man during Watergate. He was not a believer at the time. All right, he was part of Richard Nixon's team. He went to jail because of Watergate. He got saved in jail, changed his whole life, and became a passionate follower of Jesus Christ until his death. Here's what Chuck Colson said about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said, I know the resurrection's a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. These men gave everything they had to the resurrection of Jesus Christ because they saw it with their eyes. And their lives were transformed. And that leads me to my fourth and final point. Have faith because the reappearance of Jesus is a fact. Here's what it says. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all is to one untimely born. He appeared also to me. Now, there's a lot of meat on the bone there in those verses. In the essence of time, I'm going to hunker down on just a few of those numbers. First, he appeared to more than 500 people, most of whom were still alive when Paul wrote this. So again, if what he was writing was false, this would have got shot down well before it ever made it into the Bible. 
But I want to draw your attention to something that's even more important. At the very end of that statement, he says this, he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Let's start with James. Who's James? James is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. And I don't know if you know this, but historically, James did not believe that his own half-brother was the Messiah. He was raised in the same home. He watched Jesus in the carpenter shop. He listened to Jesus during his three-year earthly ministry in Galilee and beyond. And he went, Jesus went to the cross with his own half-brother saying, I know him. That's not the Messiah. And when Jesus rose from the dead, his own half-brother ate his own words. And we know that because he also contributed to part of the New Testament. James, who did not believe in Jesus when he went to the cross, believed because he came out of the tomb. And the second is Paul. Now, again, as we look in the New Testament, we look in the book of Acts, and we see who Paul used to be called Saul. And before Paul was Paul and Paul was Saul, Saul was a bad boy. Saul did not only not believe in Jesus, Saul made it his life's journey to persecute and kill anybody who put profession of faith in Jesus Christ. He dragged believers out of synagogues until one day on the Damascus Road, he gets knocked off his donkey and his eyes see the resurrected Lord Jesus and Jesus says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he was blinded. And when those scales finally came off of his eyes, he gave the rest of his life to telling people that this Jesus is real. He rose from the dead. I have seen him, and I will go to my grave telling people about him. Now you say, easy for them, Bo. If Jesus walked in this room and I saw him, I'd give my faith to him, but not till then. Well, Guess what Jesus said to the doubting Thomas? Because again, Jesus does not ridicule or condemn Thomas for having questions. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe in him until I can put my finger in the nails, the nail piercings. And when Jesus reappears, he said, come on, Thomas, stick your finger here and see that I'm, I'm flesh and bones. I'm here. What does he say at the end of the gospel of John? Verse John 20, 29, he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Do you know what that means? That means that you will have more of a reward in eternity for not seeing him than if you actually did. Because faith is believing in advance would only make sense in reverse. And if you can have faith and put your trust in Jesus before you see him with your physical eyes, that honors him in such a way that you will have a greater reward than if you actually saw him. So have faith. Have faith. So as we, as we draw to a close, let me sum all this up in one sentence. Have faith to face the facts about Jesus because if you reject his work, you'll be condemned by yours. I'll say it again. Have faith to face the facts about Jesus because if you reject his work, you'll be condemned by yours. I'm going to try to make this as practical as I can. I want you to hear me clearly. If you've checked out, check back in here. Still plenty of seats available at Bevericks, I promise. Everybody in this room, every single person in this room, unless Jesus comes back first, there will be a moment when you're not expecting it, will be your final breath here on earth. And I'll tell you exactly what is going to happen. Your spirit is going to separate from your body and you will be ushered into the presence of God and you will have to take an account for your life. Now, to those who have rejected the free offer of grace that Jesus Christ lived perfectly the way that we should have lived, died sacrificially the death that was meant for us, rose from the dead making a way from death to life, ascended to this Father to send down the Holy Spirit and is coming back to make all things new. That gospel, that good news, if you have rejected that, then God says, I'm not gonna judge you by Jesus' work. I'm gonna judge you by yours. You say, well, I'm a good person, so that's good. You're not good according to the standards of God. The Bible says in the Ten Commandments not to bear false witness against your neighbor. Have you ever lied? Yeah, well, everybody lies. Well, a liars will not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
The, the Ten Commandments said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus says, if you've had lust in your heart for someone who's not your spouse, you've already committed it. Has anybody in this room had a thought, a lustful thought about somebody who's not their spouse? Nod silently, okay? If you've had it just one time, you cannot be in the presence of God in heaven. You gotta get this. Heaven is not for good people. People think heaven's where the good people go, hell's where the bad people go. The Bible says that hell is where everybody goes unless they are saved because heaven is a place of perfection and nobody is perfect. So you need somebody to be perfect for you. And Jesus did everything that was necessary. And so the question is, with the case that I've laid before you today, are you willing to bank your life on it? Are you willing to trust that Jesus Christ died for your sins in accordance with the scriptures? Are you willing to put your faith in the fact that he was buried? Are you willing to put your fact that he rose from the dead? Are you willing to put your faith in the fact that he appeared to more than 500, including many skeptics who gave their life for him at the very end? And do you put your faith in the fact that he's coming back to make all things new? That's the question here today. My answer to you is this. Cedar Street, have faith to face the facts. Let's pray. Oh, Father. What a glorious faith you've given us. It is rooted in historical truth. It answers all the, the, the questions of the mind and the desires of the heart. It, it identifies the problem of man, which is sin, and offers a final solution to the problem, which is atonement and resurrection in Christ. Lord, if there's anybody in this room who walked in here just kind of wondering what life is all about, would you just overwhelm their heart right now to let them know that this is no coincidence that you brought them here today to hear this exact word and this may be the last chance they ever have to give their life to Jesus. I pray they would just say today, Jesus, I don't know everything but I know this. I repent of my sins and I want you to be my Lord and Savior. And Lord, if there's anybody in this room who is a Christian and they've drifted, they're not leading their families in the word. They're not reading it themselves. They believe what I said is true, but it, it doesn't show up in their life. Lord, I, I pray that today's not a day of guilt. It's a day of turning back. And for those of us, Lord, that are living for you, let today just be an affirmation. Let it be another wave of encouragement to stay in the same direction of faith. We've got the truth on our side. Jesus came full of grace and truth. And I thank you, Lord that you did for us what we could never do for ourselves. Give us the faith to face the facts. In Jesus' name, amen.